sacred completeness, I guess I'm saying, is that what about the rest of the narrative that he gave on this incident? Is what I'm saying. I'm not talking about the whole report by any stretch of the imagination. Then in you zeroed in on what the events <laughs> that he described was going on in his head that led to the behaviors that he committed on this particular occasion, and this is not the complete narrative, this paragraph. That is correct, Judge. It's not. It's uh, it is a well. It is an excerpt from it. It it is an excerpt, but it's obviously I'm, an actor. When it's just, it's, the the simple the short answer is, Judge, if you feel that it's necessary that that the entirety of what is in the subheading of Mr. Liking's account during outpatient forensic evaluation be admitted. That, that the state has no issue with that. That will start on page 40 and end on page 44. It's top of page 40 when you're being redacted and the bottom of page 42. It was our word, Mr. Ryan King's account during outpatient yes. from that point on. Yes, sir. And then stop with the interpretation of Mr. Ryan King's mental state. And just, just to be clear, there may be another section like yeah, that. Yeah, I have to just kind of look at the next. That would be the BMW section. But I, I mean, to me, that is what makes the report complete if there's a concern about completeness. I don't think the whole report. Here's the problem now. Yeah, they start. They did this. All right. Here's the problem. We put in part of the report. Why didn't the defense put in any parts of the report? That's the problem right now. Is that we didn't put in any parts of the report. So they open the door on this, and well, it's I mean, not sufficient just for this section to go in. The report has to go in. Otherwise, we're disadvantaged because now the state's putting in part of it. So why didn't the defense put in any part of the report? Any part of the report? That's Extremely problematic for us. Judge? No. Because they could not have put in this Mr. Ryan King's account, page 40, because that is an admission by a party opponent, which can only be introduced for its by the party opponent unless it comes in after the court's review as something the expert relied upon in 703 and things like that. We can certainly, I think, <clears throat> redact and redact out the page numbers. So it doesn't look like, oh, there's 39 other pages before this. Judge, number one, the report could have come. It's not hearsay. I don't even know what he's talking about. It's what she relied upon. But we were keeping the report out because it talked about competency and it had all, all sorts of other things out. We were, we were not going to try to get into that report. Now they've done that. And if I didn't know them better, I think they were trying to mistry the case. 
because this whole entire cross-examination, what it's done is fundamentally unfair to the defense. Because now competency, we're fundamentally, we are fundamentally disadvantaged now because they have put in play this idea that Mr. Ryan King was meeting with his, he, he evoked counsel, met with his lawyer, and was devising some elaborate plan to plead insanity. When in fact, he couldn't even communicate with his lawyer. That's why the that's why this whole thing started. And, but we're not allowed to go in and show that. And now they're putting in part of the report. And it, 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 this is absolutely it's, it's fundamentally unfair to the defense. And he should know better than to put a document to the jury published for refreshing recollection. That's not how it works. I agree with that. And the minute he did it. We have, a, we have the ability out of completeness to put the whole document in. They have seen page 40, forensic mental health evaluation, forensic evaluation team in Vanderbilt University. And, and Judge, sorry, thank you, Sean, how well. Every expert report is going to be hearsay because it is a statement made outside of the court. It is hearsay. Every expert report except medical examiners which are excluded because they are not proper they're made by statute there's an obligation etc et case law that but this entire report is hearsay and the segment the party opponent can put in does not mean the entire report would come in that is a tactical decision to make i agree should have passed that up we're, we're beyond that now but under the rule of completeness, the only complete part would be Mr. Ryan King's account, like Your Honor has previously noticed. The rest of it, and if you want to redact it out, forensic mental health evaluation, the bottom lines, that's fine too. That's where we are. The report itself does not come in in its entirety because one part comes in. I think. You know, again, reading under 703 in the cases under that would support that contention. And we are certainly not trying to sabotage this case. Far from it, we've done everything we can to try to get this matter to the jury. And <clears throat> actually, I apologize when we're up at the bench about the attorney. Asking for an attorney means you can get in trouble. Look for the record. I apologize for not mentioning him while we were up there. It is State Beholder, a reported decision at 15 Southwest 3rd, 905. That's the state's position. Why didn't you just ask her what was in this rather than showing it? Well, well, just to be clear, I, I asked her a number of questions it, leading up to confirm that she had conducted this interview with him and that that he he just and the, the immediately what preceding question? question was that he said he described it as being punitive. And that's that is what led to me putting this case. Well, why didn't you let her answer whether or not he described that? And if she couldn't remember, then direct her to that page of the report. Well, Judge, I wasn't I, I wasn't trying to refresh her recollection, Your Honor. I was it was an admission by a party opponent, and she had already testified both on direct and on cross that she conducted this interview. And the line of questions that I asked her before that confirmed that on the third interview she did discuss with him and that he did say that he was doing this because it was punitive. And that question immediately preceded me showing her this document. I mean, a statement that doesn't have to even be an admission, a statement of party opponent is admissible. Yes. I would just procedurally. Why didn't I mean, the defense has done a very good job of not having her read from the report. She gave a summary narrative of the various events upon which she relied in reaching the conclusions that she reached and the diagnosis that she made and avoided getting into these lengthy narratives. Why are we all of a sudden producing anything directly from this when she hasn't denied that he said this or that? I just don't understand why we're putting that in front of the jury. Well, just these are his words. Why don't you ask her what his words are? This isn't a statement that he wrote. Just an option. 
done just by asking about specific things in the report. Which is, I think, the more appropriate way to do it rather than putting up various aspects of the report. If that's your honor's ruling, then the state is fine with it.
extent that that is in any way, uh, way, form, or fashion imprinted upon your brains, push delete. You are not to consider it for any reason whatsoever. Uh, uh, that is something that was not relevant the way it was presented, and it's, uh, so just forget it. You know, we're going to kind of pick back up and we'll approach it maybe a little bit different way. All right. All right, uh, Dr. Wood. We were, um, we were discussing that as part of your third interview with the defendant, you discussed with him the mass murder that happened on April 22nd, 2018, correct? Correct. And one of the things that he described to you in that interview as well, the reason for his action was that it was punitive. Among other things, yes. But he specifically used the term Punitive. Well, I think he was using punitive in reference to like the police reports he'd made before, previous to this incident, I think is what he was referring to as punitive. Okay. And, but he was equating his actions with his actions on April 22nd, 2018, with being, with being punitive. Yes, a punitive response. Correct. Right. Punishment then. Correct. Okay. And the reason that he wanted to punish them um, is because he said he needed to do to steal something from them that they couldn't just steal back from from him. He explained he was trying to protect himself. Yes. Well, the, actually, he said, "Well, now I have to do something that's more direct. Something they can't just steal from me." Correct. That's a direct quote from him. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and so he, as he's describing why he is at, why he carried out this mass murder, he's telling you that he believed he was mistreated and as, and therefore he should be able to mistreat other people. I don't know that it was necessarily that direct of, I don't know that I would make that direct correlation there. Well, he's saying it was punitive to him. Correct. And therefore, he's going to be punitive to the, the people who were inside the Waffle House, those innocent people who lost their lives. He did not perceive them as innocent people. He referred to them as targets and believed they were part of the CIA who were this operation against him. Right. And, and he did characterize it as punitive in some ways, but ultimately he described that as um, that they weren't listening to anything else. He tried alternative courses of actions. At one point he said, what, is I, what am I supposed to do? I don't have a prison. I cannot detain them. Well, he used the word targets not in the way that you used it, though. Um, you, you discussed that and you included it in, in, you discussed that with him in your interview, did you not? Him referring to them as targets, yes. yes. And in fact, what he told you was that he used the phrase targets in quotation marks because that's because he'd seen that in military videos that were recommended to him and that's how they did it in the military. It makes it easier and that's how you have to look at it. Right? Correct. Correct. So when he says he looked at these innocent individuals who were inside Waffle House with their friends and loved ones just trying to go home, get some food before they go home, when he says he calls them targets, he's calling them targets because he wants to dehumanize them. Well, he's not necessarily... 
he doesn't perceive them as innocent bystanders. He perceived those people in the Waffle House that night as CIA agents. He referred to victim number four as a rogue agent. These were individuals that he believed were part of this conspiracy that had been doing the attacking, that had been doing the harassing, that had broken into his home, that had listened to him say, I'm coming there to do this, and stayed there in a direct effort to quote unquote taunt or continue this harassment against him. I just want to clarify, he did not perceive these as innocent bystanders at that point in time. Well, but he specifically said the military, they refer to the people as targets because it makes it easier when you have to kill them. That's what he's saying. Correct, which was consistent with his talking about grappling with this direction. He didn't want to hurt anyone and was saying that these videos of them referring to them as targets kind of dehumanizes them to a sense that, that he can do that. Now, when you say that uh, we're, we're talking about what the what the punishment was in response to, the the reality is that he was upset because the police had taken back this BMW that he had just com- carjacked from a sales lady and and taken. I think he was confused about that happening. Yes, but I don't think that was a the pivotal moment of why he did this no you think he was confused about what happened with the bmw well no i think he was he knew exactly what happened but i think when mr ranking talked about it later he said like they just came back and got the car why didn't they arrest me they i'm invisible to them they don't even do anything to me and that's when he sort of said i mean it doesn't matter what i do they're not responding and Dr. Wood, at this time, uh, I'd like to pass up a document to you. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is it? This is the handwritten journal that Mr. Ryan King provided to me as part of the evaluation. And you relied on that in in making your opinion? Yes, I considered this information. No. And you received, when did you you receive that document? I think it was May 30th when he provided it to me. Okay, and when he provided that uh, journal entry to you, he, told you that he didn't want to talk to you anymore. He did not tell that to me until the final date when I returned to speak to him. The final date being? June 5th. You went back to meet with him on June the 5th. Correct. And he told you, I don't want to talk to you. I've told you everything I have to say. Told you everything I have, everything's in the journal. I don't I don't have anything else to say. And on June 5th, you were actually going to provide him or attempt to do the malingering test on that day. I was going to administer some testing on that day, correct. And so he told you on that day, which you had intended to do the malingering test, I don't want to talk to you, and so you were unable to even get to that point. Correct. All right. And so he gave you that journal entry that we just discussed there, and and contained therein is a description of him committing this carjacking, is it not? I don't recall, but I I remember he wrote about that. I assume it's in this one. Okay, I'd ask that that be made an exhibit. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I'd like her to be able to to have it back now that it's in evidence. So, yes. How many pages is this? Twenty-five, Judge. Is that twenty-five pages? Yes. It has various dates. It starts with the date of May 21st, 2018. What what do you recall him, how he described to you still in his BMW? You mean in terms of what happened? What do, do you recall him saying to you? 
Uh, I mean, I recall that he mentioned it during the interview with me, which would have been on the first or second date. Um, I recall him saying that, referring to it as repossessing a car. Um, his description of why he did that was um, it made sense to him, I think is the word he used. It made sense to him. They had taken everything from him. He could repossess things. Um, and so he had gone to this dealership to, to get the car. And did he describe using force to you? I don't think he did. Okay. Would you have noted that if he told you that he used force to take the, the BMW? Probably. Yeah, I think that would be relevant. Okay. Um, and so based on your conversation with him, you took it to mean that he was just, he had a, he was taking this vehicle and he'd already had ownership of it in his mind. In his mind, he referred to it as repossessing the vehicle. Okay. Yes. I'd like you to, this is exhibit 70, right? I'd like you to go to the bottom of page four. I believe it's the last paragraph. Would you read what that last paragraph is? I think it's about four lines. So when I went to get my car, I wanted to get a nice one one that I felt would be comfortable on long drives and you, something I could use for a while. And can, can, you, can you continue on to page five, please? I imagine taking it back out to Colorado to drive in the mountains. That way I could visit John and Misty Turley again and enjoy the finer things in life. Keep please going. continue. For me, nothing was better than doing a couple of puffs of marijuana out of a glass pipe or uh, loud, maybe, and going for a long walk down the trail in Salida. That was my happy place in the sick world, being in the mountain air surrounded by an incredible view of nature and feeling like you were witnessing it for the very first time in your life. It was glorious, gorgeous, glorious. Then walking down to Brown Dog to get a dirty spiced chai tea or eating breakfast at the Pancake Palace was about to close, was about as close to heaven that I could get here. And please stop there. Um, so it, it appears that he's describing getting a car and going off to live a very happy life, content with friends and doing the things that he wants to do. Is that what you read from that? Sure, at different times he talked about when he used this word about repossessing and gaining access to things. He talked about it was nice for these days when he was repossessing things from the gas station and the steak dinner, that it was nice for him to experience these finer things in life. I recall him saying it wasn't since he was in Colorado that he'd experienced those. Did he, when you met with him in person, did he give you an explanation as to what happened after he committed this carjacking? In terms of what happened next? Yeah. Uh, I believe he drove back to his apartment. He talked about taking the tags off. He later took an Uber to go back to get his truck. Um, he described that the Uber driver he thought was a CIA agent because he read his mind and turned on the radio when he wanted to listen to music. And then at one point he thought the driver was gonna take him to the police station um, and was kind of surprised that the driver brought him back to his truck. Okay, and so he described to you taking this BMW and driving back to his house, and that was kind of it. That's what you recall? Yes. Okay, so he didn't describe to you being chased by the police and fleeing from them, realizing that they were there, lights and sirens, refusing to stop, getting home, taking all of the identifying information off of the car such that they wouldn't know that it was a brand new stolen car? You don't, you didn't? I don't that? recall that, but I do recall him mentioning when he got home that night that there were police and sirens there. Okay, I'd like you to go to page eight of exhibit 70. Okay. <clears throat> There's a pair. There's a paragraph there, 
fourth, fourth paragraph starts with, after I got back to my apartment. Mm -hmm. what did, could you read that for us? Sure. After I got back to my apartment with it, I took all the security and price tag stuff off the window to throw it in the trash. I noticed that the window sticker said something like $88,000, and that was before all the other charges that come with a new vehicle. It was about what I imagined it would be. I fantasized about how great it would be to keep it. I would have a really nice truck to drive around, and I could sell my old pickup truck uh, to have some extra money to get out to Colorado and find a house out there. And if you would stop there, and then I'm going to ask you to go back to page five, the second paragraph. <clears throat> Would you, would you please read that paragraph? I longed for that again, to be content and happy. Kind of sucked before because people were stalking me there. Plus, I had to go to work before. At least this time, I wouldn't have to work. I planned on finding a foreclosed house that the bank owned, and then I would repossess it so I could live there. Then I could just keep repossessing houses and cars as I needed them to make other purchases. It was going to be a good life, finally, because I worked for it. All I had to do was pick out a car to get there. Okay, so this he's describing having this dream, right? This fantasy of being in a, have this really wonderful life where he has a $88,000 car. He's buying, <clears throat> getting brand new houses. He's got these wonderful friends, right? It, that seems like it was pretty important to him. Sure. All right. Now, I want you to go to page six. I already asked you if you recall him saying that he used force to commit this carjacking. Correct. Would you read, please read paragraph two. <laughs> paragraph two? Yes, of page six. I asked the woman how to start it and how to put it in drive. She showed me and then I informed her that I was repossessing the vehicle. I have to admit that it was embarrassing and it made me nervous. I would have felt better had I could, had I could buy it or them giving it to me for reimbursement. I had to pull the keys out of the lady's hand and ask her to step out of the vehicle. Then I told her, shut the door please, and she hesitantly obliged. It was awkward but I had gotten used to it after being essentially raped on the internet and elsewhere. Okay, so in that description, him saying he, he took the keys out of this lady's hands, I mean, that sounds like he's using force, does it not? It does. Okay, all right. Do you recall him, uh, what do you recall him saying about him getting back to his apartment that evening and um, once he's got his truck, that he's left apparently somewhere near the BMW deal dealership, and and now he's got that truck. He's back at his apartment complex. What do you recall him telling you? I recall him saying that he was surprised that the police were there. Um, it sounded like he was uncertain if they were responding to the vehicle theft, um, and he made reference to. Maybe they were responding to my calls about the baby screaming. He had mentioned that he made some 911 calls and told them that there were babies screaming or something next door, and he thought maybe they would be responding to that. Um, but then he said relatively quickly, that probably wasn't it, though. They wouldn't respond to me anyway. Um, he did describe walking up to his apartment. He had a gun at the time, um, and I think he mentioned going inside and kind of holding a gun, he was afraid that he was going to have to protect himself against the police at that point. He wasn't sure if there was going to be an altercation or some sort of encounter with them. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. well Dr. Wood, in, in your recounting of it, you described it when you documented it as a him wanting to go home to, to get in the bed after waiting several hours to see if someone would come and talk to him. Is that I, not correct? I don't recall writing that. Uh, would you look at, you have your report? I do. Page 19. Page 19, okay. Yeah, it's about two thirds of the way down. Let me 
saw police cars with his lights on. He thought they were arresting his neighbors, doing weird stuff like knocking on the walls. Yeah, I, let's start with he parked down the street to avoid confrontation. Oh, he parked down the street to avoid a confrontation and then waited in an unlit part of the apartment complex that was overlooking his door. He was waiting to ensure that no one was inside his apartment. He reported that he had his handgun on him, which he regularly carried, just in case, didn't know what I'd encounter. He went home and went to bed after waiting several hours to see if someone would come and talk to him. The next morning, the car was gone. He reportedly looked around, believing that maybe it was moved to screw with me. Okay, and now I want you to go to Exhibit 70, page 10, third <laughs> paragraph. Third? Yes. I parked my truck and got out with my handgun. I put it in my jacket pocket as I walked uh, back down to my apartment. I snuck around the back of one of the other buildings to observe if anyone was at an inside, at or inside my apartment door. Sitting in the dark, I waited about five minutes before heading into my, towards my apartment. I had believed a SWAT team to be outside before outside before, late at night before, and I felt threatened. I was prepared to fire on them if it became necessary. Okay, so in, in that, it sounds as if he he's, understands that the police are there shortly after he has committed a carjacking. They are by the car that he has just taken, a number of them. He mentions that he gets his gun, hides out, decides to sneak, be sneaky and sneak into his house after it's clear that they don't know he's there. And then he goes inside and he gets his gun and he's ready to shoot them, the police officers. Correct. Okay. Now, after those officers responded to the carjacking that he had just committed, that he writes about and that he told you about, mm -hmm. they took the car back, the BMW, did they not? Correct. That's what he told you. That's my understanding. And, yeah. and you reviewed the, the, uh, the interview yes. with that, yes. the lady who was the victim of the carjacking. Correct. All right. Now, what he said in response to that was, he was going to take something from them now that they couldn't take back. Correct. This, them stealing the car and it, them taking this car back, right? The police taking this car back from him made him so angry that he wanted to go out and punish people, right? I'm... I don't know that I would make that direct relation. He was upset about that, yes. And well, I think that just, factored he, into the decision. Yeah. He just described having this grand, this grand fantasy. He's going to go out to Colorado with a brand new $88,000 car. He's got friends. He's going to smoke weed. He's going to walk the trails. He's going to eat at his favorite breakfast spot. And he's going to have all these wonderful uh, houses and things. And then, just as he has the plan, mm -hmm. His, the police come and they take the car back. And he said that made him angry, didn't he? I believe so, yes. He said that it made him very upset and very frustrated. That's, yes or no? I, I believe so. I mean, I don't have any reason to doubt you well, telling you that. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm just saying I don't recall exactly what he said, but I, I believe that you're saying that. He said that it made him very frustrated and very angry, right? Yes. Um, in fact, he was really disappointed. He was disappointed, yes. And I want you to go to Exhibit 70, page 11. I want you to read the second and third lines of that. Of the page? Yes. Of the, I'm sorry, paragraph three, the second and third. The first, second, and third lines of that sentence, that paragraph. I went back up to my apartment after that. I was really disappointed and angry because I was counting on that car. Without a job, it was only going to make it several more months before I was completely broke. Right. And then I'll go to page 
12, please. Would you read the first and second sentences? On the page? Yes. I got ready to go back out and get coffee, still in disbelief that soon turned into anger. And, that, and, and then just go to the second paragraph. Begin there. I probably yelled and shouted a lot that day, feeling trapped by these people. How would I ever be able to relocate out of the country at that point? I thought about going to Canada for political asylum, but I figured they, that they would follow me there as well. They had already followed me from Colorado, and nothing seemed to stop these incredibly evil people. You could stop there. So he's describing their actions as evil to him. Correct. Okay. And so the thing that made him angry is that he thought people were treating him in an evil way, right? He was upset about his treatment, yes. He was very upset about it, very Correct. angry about it. Correct. Right? So then in response to that, he wants to punish them and treat them in a way that is equal to what he feels like he, he went through. He did describe that when he mentioned the punitive actions. Correct. Okay. And we've already discussed that someone who understands that they're, who would describe their actions as evil is someone who is able to understand that their actions are wrong. Could you rephrase that? We discussed that someone who would describe their actions as evil, that would be consistent with the person who understands that their actions are wrong. It could be yes. 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 Okay. I, I think I want to make sure we put we put the bed. You you have not you, no testimony here that Travis Rankin didn't know what he was doing. He knew that he was killing people, right? Yes. He, he could appreciate the nature of his conduct. Correct. He knew that when he walked in, he pulled out that gun, he fired and, and shot Joe and shot Torian and shot the Ebony and shot Sharita and shot Akila and shot uh, Santia and shot James Shaw Jr. Jackson compound question. Well, oh. That he knew exactly what he was doing. He believed he was uh, killing the people that were targeting him, yes. Right. Okay. You testified earlier that he, that he received some clear command from God it, which led him to go and do this. That is what he said, yes. But you completely <clears throat> ignore the fact that this happened days after the, the police come looking for the car that he's just committed a carjacking in, and he is made, built up self-reportedly as the big, big thing that is super important to him, right? And that he's going to punish people for. I'm sorry, I don't, was there a question? Y yes, the question is, you're saying that he was commanded by God, but he's saying he was punishing people because the police came and got the car that he carjacked. Right? That, That's that what was, he said. That was one of the things that he was upset about, yes. I think just focusing on that kind of misses the picture, the larger picture. Page 13, would you please go to? Now, he, as he was angry about having the car taken back from me, he did, he wrote about, he discussed that he got home later that night from dinner and he had in his mind that uh, his apartment was, was broken into, right? Correct. He mentioned okay. that. Yes. And so then he discussed that... Um, a password folder had been moved from one place to the next? That's what he mentioned. All right. Um, I'd like you to read the first paragraph on page 13. I went over to my table that my computer was sitting on, 
only to find that someone had stolen my password folder for everything that I did on the internet. Plus, also, my bathroom door was shut again, and I never shut it after I leave. Curious to see if anyone was still in there, I went and looked. When I went inside, it smelled like rank pussy. This awful smell, like some dirty prostitute, had broken into my apartment and masturbated inside of it. It's probably that fucking Sophia girl again, I thought, although I couldn't be certain. All I did know was that I was under aggressive assault by a large group of people. There was no fairness involved in that. Okay. And... And so the aggressive assault, the aggressive assault was that someone closed the door. The, the aggressive assault is the harassment and the persecution. Which is that Taylor Swift is, likes him too much. I, that's not how I would describe it, no. And, but the, having a, um, a delusion about your relationship with Taylor Swift, literally Taylor Swift, is not, that's not uncommon. No, I've evaluated multiple defendants who have similar delusions. Right, and it's, it's also very common with other celebrities, young, beautiful celebrities like her. So Correct. It, that is a very common thing. And sure. those individuals, they're not going out and committing mass murders, right, that you've evaluated. I don't believe that his delusional belief about the relationship with Taylor Swift is the reason that this happened. I think the larger issue is the persecution, the harassment, people breaking in his home, and feeling like his life is in danger. I think if, those are two separate things. If it's not about Taylor Swift, then why did she come up in your testimony in the first place? Well, I, I talked about how this all progressed. In the very beginning, it started with these communications that were friendly with Taylor Swift. He developed this belief about having a relationship with her. But over time, those communications were no longer friendly. They were threatening and harassing. And ultimately, she's still involved, but the, that relationship has changed. It's progressed to a different place that's, that's no longer one in which he believes Taylor Swift loves him. He wrote that he went to punish people, right? And he told you that. Yes, he described it as punitive. As punitive. Correct. Which Travis Rankin is a is a smart guy. He's not lacking on the IQ scale, right? No, he's not. He he would understand the definition of the word punish or punitive. Correct. Yeah, to cause people pain and suffering for an action. Correct. Right? In order to have a, a retribution for an action. Correct. Right? That's what he was going to do. Correct. Right. So please read for me page uh, on page 13, the second paragraph. Uh, I feared for how they would go since they were acting outside the law already. How would they try to poison my food again? Would they try to sneak in again and kill me? I had but I had hit my limit. I had to do something to stop it since no one else would. I tried to punish them by repossessing their car since they wouldn't make things right on their own, only for them to steal it again from me. This time I would have to punish them by taking something they couldn't take back, some of their own lives. He is writing that in response and in retaliation for a car that he stole being taken back for the police, even though he thinks that that is wrong, that he's going to go and take some of their own lives. That was part of, of what he was responding to, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, his words are, this time I would have to punish them by taking something they couldn't take back, some of their own lives. That's what he wrote, didn't he? Correct. Right. He's saying, I've been punished. They need to be punished by me taking some of their lives. Correct. And then he did that. Correct. At no point in this page 13 did he say that he had been commanded by God. He does not mention that here, no. So he has formed in his mind the decision to go and kill people as a result and, and as a reaction and in retaliation for the fact that he that this car was taken from him. And then by the time he meets you, 
He's saying that he's been commanded by God. So I, I think I just want to clarify that his consistent report is that this was self-defense and that yes, he, he knows that he harmed people and he shot people in that, and it described it as punitive. But in his mind, he has consistently said that this was an effort to protect himself from the persecution. And certainly it was temporally related to the car being taken back, but ultimately the culmination of years of this persecution. Well, when you say that he was acting in self-defense, he, he did not say to you at any point in time that anyone had physically, anyone at that Waffle House was physically assaulting him. No, he believed they were the agents who were involved in this persecution. And in that passage I just read, he said, I, I didn't know what they were going to do next. Were they going to come in and kill me? Were they going to poison me? And so this, this is speaking to what Mr. Reinking was responding to, this threat that he was perceiving in that moment, and going to the Waffle House, who he believed was, was housed with people who were a part of this, these agents that were involved, that he later referred to as targets. I, I understand what you're saying, but he's also, in a very reasonable interpretation of his words, is that he is equating his actions with of killing someone, killing multiple people, with that of someone who would poison someone. That he's saying that his actions are the same as poisoning another person. That is understanding that your conduct is wrong, is it not? I mean, in, in the sense that he's protecting himself from, he, he described it as it was me or them. He, he didn't say right now at this moment I am being forced to take poisonous uh, liquid, right? Correct. Right. And he didn't say that when he got to that Waffle House that somebody was forcing poison down his throat, did he? Correct. Right. So he is saying his actions are the same as those that he believes are evil, that are would poison him, that would kill him, right? He's saying that's what he did. The same as that. Correct. I, I think you're trying to impose logic and reason that, that we possess onto someone who wasn't processing and reasoning in the same way that the rest of us are. Well, we have to impose logic and reasoning as we make an assessment because the sure. jury has to make a determination about whether or not the defendant could appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. And you're telling me that you have looked at his words and his phrases and tried to say that he couldn't equate the two of saying, I'm going to go and murder people when he's saying as in punishment and in retaliation for someone taking a car from him, which he believed was basically trying to kill him. Like, he is saying... Judge, there's no question. Now, I'm not sure that. Let's start that all over. Sure, Judge. <laughs> I could do that again. Well, not the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get to the question. <laughs> the point, though, is a person who can say, if, if I'm being harmed, I'm caused immense suffering because someone is doing something to me that is harming me. And I say, what I'm going to do in response is I'm going to harm someone else. That is understanding that what is happening to me is wrong and that what I am going to do is wrong. That is, that is making a moral assessment, is it not? Sure. Okay, so he is making a moral assessment as he discusses, recounts the, the days that led up <laughs> to him walking into that Waffle House and, and mm -hmm. killing four people, is he not? Correct. <clears throat>
I have no further questions, Judge. Dr. Wood, you have that journal in front of you? Uh, I gave it back. Can she have the journal back, please? <laughs> Dowdy finished with this question. Will you turn to page 13? Okay. And you recall just a few minutes ago he asked you to read items off of page 13. Correct. This is about somebody being in his house and all that. Remember that? And then do you recall Mr. Dowdy saying there's nothing mentioned in there about God making him do anything? Correct. Turn to page 14, the very next page. Start with the second paragraph and read the rest of it. I'm not sure if I went to bed that night or stayed up mulling over what I should do. I remember praying to God, asking him what I should do. Sometimes I don't get an answer, but this time I did. In Morgan Freeman's voice, God told me, take your gun and go to the Waffle House. If you go now, you will only have to shoot three of them. Take nothing but your gun and green jacket and a couple of spare magazines. Then I want you to drive your truck there, shoot them, and then walk back to your apartment. Keep going. It wasn't an audible voice, but one that I imagined in my head nonetheless. It seemed to be a command from God the Father as found in the Christian Holy Bible as the Trinity. If, <clears throat> if it was just, if it was in fact God, how could I disobey a direct order? I believed in Oh, I believed in, oh, Celine and the heavens, didn't I? I believed in God. So why was it so hard for me to believe this? It was a test of my faith. In the last paragraph. <clears throat> God, if that voice wasn't you, I pray that my gun won't fire, that the firing pin would stick, the gunpowder wouldn't ignite, or the gun would jam. Now, he asked you about the commandment by God. All we had to do was turn the page, right? Correct. And it's all there. Correct. I talked to you about the BMW, the day of the BMW. You recall that? I do. And he was talking about stealing the BMW, repossessing the BMW. Correct. Can you turn to page 9 in the journal? Just read the second paragraph out loud, please. <clears throat> Only I didn't make it that far. Later the same day that I went to repossess the X6. I called an Uber ride to take me back to my truck. The man who answered was right around the corner from my apartment. He said it would only be a few minutes and then be by to pick me up. About 15 minutes later, he was outside in a silver minivan. I believed him to have an Arabic accent. Something about the man seemed nervous to me. We also went way off route, going back into Nashville before heading south. After riding with him for a while, I took him for a CIA agent. I thought to myself, I would probably be nervous riding with myself too if I had seen everything that they would see about me. I thought about the gray aliens and Atlantis as we drove. Along with the fact that I had just repossessed a $90,000 vehicle and was now hitching a ride with the CIA. Does that sound like a person in their right mind on that day? It does not. If you would, would you turn to page 16 of your report? Are you there? I am. You made reference earlier that you had uh, reviewed an audio 
uh, interview of the salesperson from BMW. Do you recall that? I do recall that. And I believe in your report that you made notes of what she said in that audio review. Is that correct? I did. All right. If you would, to yourself, read paragraph four, starting with she, describe. You want me to read that aloud? Oh, there's a number of those. I don't want you to read it out loud. Okay. What did she say about in that paragraph about her experience? She described him as behaving sort of odd, a little bit strange. Uh, he wasn't disheveled. She said the only aggressive act was him taking the key from her. Um, and she said that there were seemed to be like moments of clarity with him and moments of not. The, the paragraph right before that is what I meant as the fourth one. I'm sorry? The paragraph right before that. She said it occurred to her. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to read that? To yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. In the audio interview that you considered in coming up with your opinion, what did she relay during that audio interview about her interaction with him? She described him as very strange and said he acted like a friend of hers who had paranoid schizophrenia. You were asked some questions about why didn't you watch the trial all day Monday and all day Tuesday. You recall that? I do. Do you have a job? I do. Do you have any other cases other than this? Plenty. Did you have a lot to do on Monday and Tuesday other than watch television? I did. You were also asked about defense attorneys making a request for uh, evaluations. Do you recall that? I do. You've done over what is it, 800 evaluations, almost 900 or something? The, for the court order, I think it's about just under 900. Okay, and are you familiar? Is it a, a practice for defense attorneys to perhaps seek evaluations of their clients? The overwhelming majority of requests do come from the defense. Okay, and, and what is that? Why do they do that? Well, they're the ones who have interactions with a defendant. A prosecutor wouldn't have personal interactions, and the judge wouldn't have interactions to suggest that they might need this type of evaluation. Okay, and in maybe what, what couple instances would they do that in? If, well, let me ask you this. If they thought their client was not competent, do you think that they would ask the court sometime for an evaluation? Well, great brain question. Okay. The, the state said that the defense asked the court to order you or Vanderbilt to do a an evaluation. Correct. Okay. Why did they ask that? Objection. Doors open. It's the We're not going down that road. All right. Would it be fair to say if a defense attorney thought that there might be something mentally wrong with their client that they would ask the court to conduct an evaluation? That is often the reason. Okay. And it's the process in Davidson County, by contract, that if that request is made to the judge, that the court orders Vanderbilt to do it, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, it's true that a defense attorney could go out and hire whoever they wanted to do to do it, couldn't they? I, I believe so. There's some issues about funding, but technically, yes. Okay. But instead, they go to the court. The court picks somebody that they believe would come up with an independent evaluation, right? Through the contract, correct. In other words, they want somebody who's not going to give an opinion that's biased toward the state or biased toward the defense, correct? Correct. And is that what you do? Yes. And is that what you've done close to 900 times for yes. Davidson County? Yes. Now, you were talked you were you were asked a question about um, did the defense attorney give you items to persuade you? You remember the, that that language? Correct. Yes, I do. All right. 
if a defense attorney has a client that they think has a mental health issue, is it normal for them to go out and investigate and try to find any evidence that may support that? I, I believe so, yes. Okay, would you wanna know if there's any prior history of mental illness with the person, any diagnosis? Yes. Any type of um, interaction like with the Tazewell Police Department, stuff like that? Yes. Okay. If there's any videos out there that I might indicate, that. give some ind indications whether or not somebody's mentally ill, would that be relevant? That would be relevant. That's what you do. That's, that, that's what the de defense attorney does, right? Correct. Okay. And the state, they can send you anything they want to send you to, right? Correct. We request information from both the defense and the prosecution. Okay. And then you gather all that information, law enforcement records, interviews, you do your own interviews, whatever you do, and you come up with an independent evaluation. Correct. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. There was a there was a question about the last day that you went out to meet with Mr. Ranking. Is it fair to say he didn't have any idea what you were going to do that day when you showed up? Yeah, I don't think he had any idea. Probably thought we would just keep talking. Okay. So the question was asked, oh, that was the day you were going to do the malingering test he didn't want to talk to you, right? Correct. But he had no idea you were going to do a malingering test, did he? Yeah, I don't think there was any connection. And, and the test that I was going to administer is really more one of uh, it's more psychodiagnostic. It provides more information about accurate diagnosis, but it also has validity scales that we can use to assess for response style. But he had no idea that would even possibly be coming. There's no it. way he could have known. You may mention that he thought at one time that maybe you were part of the conspiracy, right? He did make comments to his attorney to suggest that, and I believe in the journal he mentioned as well. Okay, and did you, with your interaction with him, when you were talking to him, did it seem like something, um, this is the bad question, something was wrong with him? He was off, mentally ill? Did I perceive something yeah. wrong with Mr. Reinking? Yes. Okay. Now, you were asked again earlier about being provided information. Uh, in an attempt to pers to persuade you, that was the word that was used. Correct, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to play uh, at least one of the videos, the YouTube videos that was provided to her, uh, to show uh, that what the evidence is, the types of evidence that she considers. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. that's one hundred seven hundred three. Of course, would have to make a decision ahead of time. Yeah, I would have to review it first. Liability trustworthiness, whether or not it generally meets rules for admission. Hmm. Okay. I have no idea. Is the video yeah, I, one of his? Pardon? Is it a video of one of, that he created? So it's a video, it's a YouTube video. Well, there's several YouTube videos that he created that were provided to her in order for, as part of her evaluation. Obviously, the state has them as well. The videos up him. I guess I'd have to review it. I don't. I have no idea what it contains. Or... Okay. If if just give me one second. I may have a resume.
you know what I what the what we are willing to do because the video is the video whether she's sitting there or not sitting there, and we have also potentially two other witnesses coming that have information with regard to the video as well. We'd be willing to stop at this point and then at a break or tonight if the court could review it and make its ruling in the morning and then we would be in a position to perhaps play it in the morning if it's admissible at that point. Would you need Dr. Back for that or just? I, I don't need Dr. Wood back for that because the, she she's back. considered the video. We can play the video. Now if they think they need to cross examine her then we can stop right now about the video, then we can stop now and I can provide it to the court. The observation I would make is they have not laid the foundational ground at this time under 703. I'll review it this evening. And I can have her come back. She's available tomorrow too. She might be here anyway. Be on call <laughs> in the morning. Okay. Then with reserving that issue, then that's my questions on redirect. All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hold on. Oh, I thought you were good. Oh, no. Just handing that back. You Yes, I have some. Um, I may. Dr. Wood, <clears throat> you read about a defendant talking about the being commanded by God. Um, you read from the journal in which he said the voice of God was Morgan Freeman's. And then later said it wasn't so much of a voice, yes. But that's what he wrote, it was Morgan Freeman. He initially wrote that, yes. Okay, and did the fact that he described Morgan Freeman being the voice of God give you any pause in, dis in any way? I mean, I thought it was unusual, um, and then I followed up with him on that during the interview, at which point he clarified it wasn't really a voice, and then described, you know, if you have a personal relationship with God, you sometimes kind of are directed in these ways, and it's not necessarily a command so much as, a, a, or not so much a voice as something that you sort of hear, not necessarily as a voice. I'm, I want to make sure I got the timing right. You, you read the journal entry before you did the personal interview, or after? Excuse me? The handwritten journal entry. Sure. Did you read it before you conducted the interview? No, but when I asked him during the interview and he said hearing a voice, a command, I think it's in the report where I said, describe the voice to me. I asked questions about it. And he, that's when he clarified it was not so much a voice, but sort of a direction. We're going to have to take a recess. Yes, sir. request for a recess. Understood. That's what we're going to do at this time. Again, members, you're just keeping golf to yourself and not to anybody's transparent report.